but it's that word. It's not recovered. It's recovery or I'm recovering, right? I learned that anytime I call myself recovered and I take myself off the offense, bad things happen and I get complacent and I get lax and, you know, it happens. But it's that recovery mindset that's been really, really important for me. Welcome to another episode of Relentlessly Resilient, presented by Minky Couture, a weekly podcast where people share real life experiences and the tools they've developed to move forward and live their best life. I'm Michelle Scharf. And I'm Jenny Taylor. And as Michelle mentioned, we are presented by Minky Couture, and it is the perfect time of year as the weather gets a little chillier to grab that Minky of yours. You can go in person and pick out all the different fabrics. There's not only different styles of fabrics, but different actual fabric makeups. You can have the hug is different from the silky one, is different from the luxury line, is different from the lighter line. So if you like a good, heavy, almost weighted blanket, they have that for you. If you're looking for something a little softer and shimmier, they have that for you. You can go into any of their six locations here in Utah or shop right from your computer or phone at minkycouture.com. Today we're excited, Michelle. You and I were talking offline just a minute ago about our guest today, Brayden Eads. Thank you for joining us, Brayden. Thanks for having me. It's so good to be here. It is great to have you, and we're going to jump right into a conversation. I love how you presented it, your recovery journey from a pornography addiction, and something we probably don't talk enough about to gain real understanding in our society, but that doesn't mean it's not something we can all benefit from being willing to talk about. I love how you said we don't want to sweep these things under the rug. So just really quickly, Brayden and I are connected. We've never actually met in person that I'm aware of, but we're connected through a speaking, what would you call it? Coaching maybe, Brayden? Yeah, I was trying to figure out, like, I, I kind of want to call her like a student, like a co-student, co- Yeah, we're co- colleagues in class. person. Yeah. So we're both part of a program that helps people who want to be professional public speakers and learn to make money speaking and sharing a message and inspiring and motivating other people. And I had reached out to that group and said, hey, if any of you have some stories you're willing to share, my friend Michelle and I have this great podcast. So, Brayden, thanks for being willing. I don't want to take any more time on pleasantries. Let's jump right in. Can you introduce yourself to us and give us a little background? And then let's talk about this journey of yours. Yeah, that would be awesome. Thanks so much. I'm excited to talk about it, which is weird. (laughs) (laughs) My story is not unique. And I think, you know, talking about it is, is super important. So, my name is Brayden. I come from a family. Uh, I got two kids, a, a, a wife that I do not deserve. She is a, a phenomenal human being and is Googleable. That's how cool she is. Um, she's a singer songwriter. I um, work as a customer success manager in tech, but I've always wanted to get into the world of public speaking, which is how Jenny and I met. So I'm, I'm currently on, on that journey a little bit. So when I talk about my pornography journey, I think of all the way back to well, I was like, what's my earliest memory of, of being exposed to this? And my earliest memory, and this is not meant to be scary. We'll talk about it here in a little bit. But I was seven years old. I was in a room with a friend at a sleepover, and it was a video game that popped up. And I remember seeing what happened on that video game and experiencing feelings that nobody's ever talked to me about before. It was this really like it's just I can remember it I can smell the room it was just this huge experience that nobody had ever really warned me about what those feelings were like or what that was and that was that was kind of my earliest earliest experience and as you get older right those feelings grow and they mature and being you know a member of the LDS faith uh, growing up you know it started to become this very taboo you know conversation the vocabulary used within the church, if you'll remember, was by Gordon B. Hinckley. And he said, avoid this thing like the plague. He called it the plague. <laughs> and as I grew older and started to experiment more with these feelings of desire and lust, I obviously then started to equate this feeling with the plague. So if I had a problem with this growing up, I had the plague. So, wow, that insert, is so, I mean, that's scary. Yeah, it is. And it's, it's a big feeling, too, because, I, I don't know, I, all things Brene Brown. I am the biggest Brene Brown fan in oh, the universe Yeah, now, me too. But it, had she been there around to talk to me about what shame was, 
right? It was this feeling of shame. And that is where this thing just thrives. So growing up, you know, I was, I was a 90s kid, early 2000s kid. I didn't have a, like, a phone or a tablet in front of me, in front of me fortunately. It was very difficult to, to kind of go and experience it. But I would find ways. I would kind of, like, hack into my dad's laptop, you know, and all these things. And I remember, you know, or I'd stay up late at night watching cable television, and finding just little things that I could just, you know, kind of feel this dopamine rush again, you know, not knowing what it was then. And then the other part of this is I have what I call nice guy syndrome in the kindest way possible. And oh. the, the way that, the, <laughs> yeah, the way that I know what a nice guy is, that, <laughs> right, <laughs> is that I'm a human being, right? I do human being things, but nobody can find out about it. So not only does this thing strive in secrecy in the way that it is. But also, like, nobody could just find out about me. Nobody could, like, that's, I just, the worst thing in the world was if somebody found out about me and my own, like, you know, shortcomings, things that are very human. And so hiding it, hiding Braden, it, forever hiding it. Brayden, yeah. let's stop for a minute and talk about that. Because for a lot of our listeners, I don't think that they will really know what a Mr. Nice Guy is. I dated oh, one at one time, yeah. and I would tell people, well, he's a Mr. Nice Guy. And they're like, oh, that's great. And I'm like, no, it's not great. No, it's <laughs> it is not. not great. And for our listeners, you can go out there. There are Mr. Nice Guy support groups uh, right. for men. And it sounds like being a nice guy is like the nice guy always wins last. Right. Like we hear the, the phrase a Mr. Nice Guy and people might think like, well, that's not a bad thing. It is a bad thing. And, and do you want to share why or? Absolutely. Do you want it's to define horrible. it a it, it, little bit for our, our listeners? Yeah, it, it's a book. It's by Robert Glover. I have it sitting on my desk because it's my mantra now. Um, I've read that it, book six yeah. times. <laughs> right? Yep. Because you know what happens. You thrive in secrecy. You're lying because you, you want to be able to come across as the best person in the world and you want people to think the world of you. So you're you're inflating your own accomplishments. You're just scared to be authentic. And, and so you're not disclosing the entire truth or disclosing is like being the worst thing in the world. It's terrifying to tell the people you care about most, you know, I did this thing that I'm not proud of and it's the worst thing in the world. So that's, you know, this nice guy syndrome is completely fake. It's this, you know, the face I would put on of who I wanted everybody to see me as and just not living this authentic life, which number one destroys relationships. And number two, it destroys my own self identity. I, I was striving so hard to fit into these molds of what I think people wanted that I never spent time to find out who am I and how do I show up as that person. Right. I, I think that that's really important to talk about because, first of all, you, you're you talking about pornography and the shame that came with that, right? You brought that up. Right. But the Mr. Nice Guy syndrome is complicated because it is steeped in shame. Right. So it's like a double shame box for men that suffer with this. It's like, I'm not good enough. Nobody will love me if I tell them who I am and I'm honest and I'm truthful. Yep. I'm not worthy of being loved. And then there's this self-loathing that happens. It's almost like a emotional addiction a way of being that instead of being an alcoholic or a drug user, you overcompensate by this persona that you create for yourself. Would that be fair? Oh my gosh. I want to give you a hug. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I mean, it's spot on. It's, it's so spot on. It's scary. That is perfect. Yeah. Unfortunately I lived it. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah I'm, I'm, well, I, unfortunately, like my life is helping me go through this transformation as well. And it's painful. And it's it is hard. painful. And it, you have to get raw. You have to have a third party therapist to walk you through some really, really tough things. It's important. And yeah. it's, you're going to lose out on so much of life and destroy so many relationships if you don't face that part of you. Yeah. For any of you men suffering out there, there is a ton of resources online. And in the state of Utah, there are several groups throughout the Wasatch Front that meet both during lunch hours or after office hours. So there is support and there is help out there. I just want to make that clear because, you know, it's a painful thing. I'm sorry that you're having to live it. I feel like 
maybe we should address a little bit the culture of, I think it, it's a little extra problem. I know it happens across the globe, but I feel like the culture of the church, the LDS church in general creates this culture because the shame box religiously for being involved in pornography is so high. Just like you said, it was a plague, right? It was a plague to you. It's like, maybe the conversation should change a little bit. Maybe the conversation needs to look like, look, this is normal. If you see these things and you have these reactions, it's driving a part of you that is very normal. However, there are some dangers that come along with participating in it. Right. Like we need to have a different conversation. And I was very active for a long time. I've sat in many state meetings where it was like, don't do this, don't do this. But that's not helpful. (laughs) No, not at all. So go ahead and tell us what you think needs to be done and why you feel that this conversation is so important to be having today. Uh, I mean, it's... uh... Gosh, I'll talk on two things. So, so the first thing is is that shame part of it, right? Mm-hmm. And my favorite sentence from Brene Brown is defining like how to think about shame differently. Shame says, I am a mistake, right? And I can tell you the number of men, and I, I am sure some women out there, the m- number of nights I would sit and just, I punched my pillow. I was so upset, so mad at myself and just just living in this blackness of just like, first of all, I'm a horrible person. Why do I feel this way? Number two, why can't I overcome this? And there's just so much of that. So the way to think about this, though, is to overcome shame. I am not a horrible person. I am a good person and I make mistakes. And the awakening that I had for me was I, I read this article. It's called Intimate Solutions. It's by Dr. Michael Buxton. Changed my life. Where he ultimately got to the sense, he's like, hey, look, <laughs> you know, I would think I'm this person that's ultimately going to wind up on some sex offender list eventually. That's who I am. I, you know, nobody's going to want to be with me. Nobody wants this to be a part of this life. It's not true. In fact, it is a lack of intimacy and compassion in your life. And you're resorting to what he calls fantasy solutions to fill this void. And Mm -hmm. therein, for me, lies the antidote to this addiction and this shame cycle. And that is connection. We're connecting with human beings and filling the gaps with intimacy and compassion is how you overcome this. Now, with the nice guy syndrome part of this, right, I would come home from school as a kid, my mom, and I'd have a hard day. And my mom would say, I can tell you've had a hard day. What's been going on? And guess what I said? I'm fine. Right. <laughs> I'm fine, Mom. I don't want to. I don't want to have to give you this burden of me of the things I'm struggling with. Number one, because I had an older sibling who was very kind of rough and all over the place, and I didn't want to inflict that upon my parents. So I would never talk about what I was struggling with. I would never let her see me for who I truly was, and and to see me struggle and to disclose the things that I, you know, did, did that I didn't like about myself. I would just not talk about it. And that's that nice syndrome part. So it completely fuels this idea of this. So that's where all of a sudden, and I love what you're saying, you know, I'm on this, you know, LDS faith journey too. We come to church and we have this, you know, perfect family life. We want to get up on Testimony Sunday and we want to share all of our great testimonies and say my favorite phrases. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt. And these things of like who we are, you know, that's what I want to be. I want to be the spiritual giant, this bigger, but it's not authentic. And we're starving ourselves of intimacy and compassion when we don't get up on fast and testimony Sunday and say, hey, you know what? This part about the history of my faith is really, really hard for me to swallow. And I just wanted to share that with all of you. That never happens on Sunday. No. But when we do in those in those respectful atmospheres, I, you know, there's certain people that earn that part of you, right? They earn the ability to hear you share those parts of you. Right. So I get why you wouldn't share that over the pulpit. But still, like, I, you know, I'm on this faith journey. I said no to my first calling recently because it didn't sit well with me. And I sit now in these Wednesday meetings and I share with them. I went to church on Easter Sunday and it, 
it was horrible. I hated it. <laughs> Instead, I went into the mountains, and that's where I found God. And this raw, authentic part of me created this beautiful connection, which is how I connect with people or I'm striving to now authentically is, is sharing those parts of me. I love that. I think it's really hard for people that are raised in a religion sometimes to find their own way in their relationship with God. Like sometimes we think like yeah. going to church and reading our scriptures is enough and eventually we'll have found this relationship with God when in actuality it takes sometimes a quiet walk in nature to meet God where there's some quiet time where he can reach your heart. You go. I love that. And to, to explore though, you know, I, I, we were, we were told, it has to be prayer and scripture study. We have to go to the temple once a month with our spouse, and we have to go to church every Sunday in order to experience all the blessings of God. And if I don't do those things, I'm going to enter into shame, and probably why my life isn't the way it should be is because I'm not doing those things. Instead of leaning in to where do the things feel icky, and where do I feel God? And if I don't feel it at the temple, for me, that's okay. Right. That's okay. That it, you know, and let me go find out where I do feel him. And yeah. not feel and, bad. You know, some people are temple, doing yeah. all of those things and they're still not feeling it, but they stay faithful to it for years. I, I met a woman who said I for twenty five years it took me to realize that I didn't have a relationship with God. I had a relationship with a schedule and uh, the expectation of doing things, yeah. but I didn't have a relationship with God. So I think it takes time for people, especially if you were just raised in it. It's like, this is your the expectation for your life. At some point, you have to have the come to Jesus moment, right? You have to find God right. for yourself. back to you said connection and I totally agree with you but before that you said intimacy and in order to have true connection you have to have intimacy you have to be able to get to that place where in to me you see oh I love that right and that means to really see me I have to show you all of who I am right and not everything is pretty. Not everything is comfortable. Right. Not everything is good. But that right. doesn't mean that I'm less worthy, less desirable, less lovable. Those things don't, our humanness doesn't make us less worthy. Beautiful. And so it's getting to that intimacy. But in order to get to that intimacy, you have to be authentic. And the first person you have to do that with is yourself. Yourself. Yeah. I think yeah. that's the that's hardest okay. part. I see it in so many people where they want it so bad, but I see them struggling and being honest with who they are as a person. Yeah. And you have to not internalize your stuff, right? Jennifer right. from Place and Fife always talks, if you know Jennifer from Place and Fife, she talks about facing your junk, <laughs> right? And, and to not internalize that and, and fall into a shame spiral, again, I am a good person who makes mistakes. And somebody sits there and says, hey, Brady, you know what? It's a nice guy syndrome. You suck at telling me what's really going on in your life. You really think it's disclosure. And for me to be like, oh, and lean into that and be curious, curious. I love that word. My therapist helps me with that word. Mm-hmm. Let's get curious about, you know, X, Y, Z. And, and lean into those things and face it. Face your junk. It's so important. Yeah. So I'm curious. I mean, this is this sounds like it's been a lot of your faith journey and maybe some of the struggles that your faith upbringing has had with this exposure or your feelings with the pornography. But you started by calling this a recovery journey. So yeah. I'd love to jump in. It, it sounds like there's one thing to reconcile maybe the mandates, quote unquote, of your faith with the choices of your life. But... The fact that you use recovery journey makes me feel like you've come from not just, hey, I don't need to feel shame about this, but maybe I do need to change. Maybe not change the feelings. There's nothing wrong with the feeling, the emotion. Do you see where I'm going with this? Can you walk me through that to where it's not just a reconciliation of faith beliefs, but if you're calling it a recovery, that connotes some type of 
change away from where you were that you no longer wanted to be, whether it was a plague or not. Maybe those words led sure. to a lot of shame. Yeah. But you've recovered from something which in and of itself leads to thinking there was something from which to recover, in your opinion. Can you walk us through that? Yeah, I love I love that you asked that question because it's, it's the important part of the story is, is Braden, what's going on in, in your world now? And so when I when I was uh, in college, I was dating this woman that I that I thought I was going to marry at the time. You know, she in every way, shape, and form was like, okay, I've waited my whole life for, for this moment. You know, I I didn't kiss anybody until I kissed her because I wanted to save it for her because I had night nighting this knight in shining armor idea of who I was as this person and. I hadn't figured out this pornography part. And this, so I, I disclosed to her, um, I think it was one of the first times I'd ever like proactively disclosed instead of being caught. And and she broke things off. Um, and then she, she kind of lingered a little bit. And then I lied to her about my recovery journey. And then she's like, I'm done. This is, I'm done with this. And at that point, something switched. So first of all, I read this article and started, you know, stopped beating myself up so much because I'm like, oh, I'm not this, you know, sex crazed lunatic. I am lacking in intimacy and compassion in my life. That's number one. Number two is I no longer cared who knew. I didn't care who knew. I was like, I'm I'm done trying to hide this thing. I'm done living in this, you know, I had an alter ego. I named him. I named him Scott. <laughs> it's wow. like this, this, yeah, like this, this alter ego, like I'm done, like having two different identities of who I am. This is something I'm willing to do anything right now to fix. And that's truly where this journey began, right? I was willing to try anything. I was willing to tell anyone. I was willing to connect. And the beautiful part of this is as I learned, I started experiencing that connection, right? That intimacy where I, I let people know what I was struggling with and there's a delicate balance between those relationships, right? A, a, a intimate partner relationship is different than a friend relationship and how you disclose. But whenever I disclosed to those friends, I felt this outpouring of love and understanding and what help do you need with. And that's when I started putting plans together. There's lots of acronyms in the church for these trigger moments that come. My favorite is blast, bored, lonely, angry, stressed, tired. Sitting down, identifying those feelings and being okay with sitting with those negative feelings instead of feeling like I needed to get rid of them. Another big leap was like, okay, I'm feeling something that doesn't feel good. Let's identify what that feeling is, first of all, and then let's figure out a way how we can address what it is that I'm lacking in my life besides, you know, just going to a fantasy solution of some sort. And through a great long time of trial and error of meeting with therapists, trying to replace those things, reprogramming the neuron pathways in my brain, fixing it and getting there. I can say over the past 10 years, I've had only a few hiccups um, that are still there. So that's another important part I, I, I want to touch on. But there is a, a real path to recovery that I'm experiencing. But it's that word. It's not recovered. It's recovery or I'm recovering, right? I learned that anytime I call myself recovered, and I don't, and I take myself off the offense, bad things happen. And I get complacent and I get lax and, you know, it, it happens. So I have this mindset of recovery. I have a set of tools. For example, my phone doesn't have social media, internet, or anything on it because my phone is, is a weak point for me. And so I have it completely locked down where it is possible for me to relapse through my phone. And there, there are other different rules that I've put in place, but it, it's that recovery mindset that's been really, really important for me. I love that. And I appreciate that you're willing to share that and being able to recognize in yourself. I mean, it sounds to me now you're wanting to make changes, not because your church or your parents or your girlfriend said you should or you have to, but because you're recognizing what works better for you and what leads you to not feel those feelings of of shame or secrecy or lack of self-worth. Is, is that a fair summary of that? Spot on. So let's talk a little bit. You said you've got a wife, you've got kids. How do you talk with them? How do you teach them? And does any of this come out in the public speaking that you do from the stage, any of this story, or, or what conversations do you usually have in those environments? Yeah, it's a great question. I'll start with my wife. 
she and I, when I started dating towards my, the end of my 20s and I got married around 28, I told her on our third date. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know if that's a really good thing, but that, you know, that's what I, I, I was so open and honest with people because it was so important to me to say, hey, this, is, this has been a part of my past. It is something that I always need to be aware of. And if you're not okay with it, let's stop now. And, and we'll move on because I don't want you to have to go through all of this and then find out when a year into marriage, oh, I didn't know this was a part of you. We, we've learned a lot for our marriage about how to manage and handle this. One of the things that's helpful in our marriage is if I am feeling triggered, the conversation, right, we need to connect as an intimate partnership, but there's also a little bit of anxiety that comes with that, right? So if I go to my partner and I say, I'm feeling triggered, that also triggers anxiety, and it kind of gets in the way of us actually connecting. Besides that, the trigger is because of a lack of something in me. So that's the conversation that needs to happen. So I need to be self-aware to know if I'm feeling triggered, why? Where does that come from? Bored, lonely, angry, stressed, tired? What thing is there that's lacking? And let's have that conversation so that it's a real authentic conversation I'm having a super stressful day at work. You know, this woman sent me three angry emails in the morning, and I have no control over resolving it. This is a recent one. And so that's the conversation I have. And I talk about that and resolve and find and connect through that way. The other part of this is we learned that it is better for me to not have my wife be my accountability partner. That is, has not worked for us. And so my accountability partners are really trusted people that can offer that compassion and understanding if if there are any hiccups in the future. I think that's two important things that we learned throughout our marriage as we continue to grow together as a partnership. Aside from that, for our kids, right, it's, it's not a matter of if, right? So I, I tell that story of when I'm seven years old and I get worried people are going to say, ah, oh, my kids are never going to go to a sleepover ever again. <laughs> or I'm just trying to set up the barriers to prevent it. That's not what's going to help. What's going to help is to create a safe space that when it does happen, they come to you first, right? We're not making sexuality a taboo subject in our family. We're, we're talking about those feelings as they may come up. You know, my kids are five and two, so we're still very much in the early stages of figuring out what this looks like. But I, I know what I aspire to be. And those, those are the important parts is come talk to me if you feel that. If you do see it, come talk to me. Let's talk about the feelings you experienced. Let's talk about what that was like and what those feelings are for and how they're good and how you shouldn't like make them the plague and be like, yes, they are good. We need to bridle them for relationships, and connecting with people, right? That's what we aspire and hope to create for our house and our kids. You know, not this fortress of like, let's never ever talk about it. Let's never, let's do everything we can to protect our kids from never being exposed to it. You know, there's an element of safety and, and being a good parent, but ultimately it's psychological and emotional safety, I think is, is important. In my speaking world, I don't talk about this on stage. I talk about the ROI of human connection in the corporate world. If anybody ever asked me about this, though, I would love to put a keynote together to talk about this more in detail in recovery journeys if, if there are people who want to listen, for sure. But currently is not part of, of my speaking repertoire. So interesting. You've hit on so many key factors. Right. It's also interesting, like, of course, today we live in a digital world. Our kids are much more likely to be exposed online either intentionally or unintentionally. All day, every day. Uh, yes. I mean, I it's, it's crazy. It's so prevalent. I will share with you, you know, I was in the pre-digital age, but I was young when I was first exposed. And I can tell you the moment when I was exposed, hearing your story made me go right back to that moment. I haven't thought about right. it in years. But I could tell you the kid's name. I can see his face, what he looked like. Mm. Our school t- class went to a trip to the San Diego Zoo and a boy came up to me in my classroom and showed me a picture of the male anatomy and I was horrified because I had no idea what I was looking at it was (laughs) just a picture of only the male anatomy I had no idea what I had looked at but I mean all these years later clearly I now know what that picture was but I remember seeing it and being just shocked and horrified like I don't even know what that is but I was young I was like in fifth grade so I was what eight nine yeah Oh, God. Yeah, you know, super young. Yeah. So that's even before this day. I think sometimes parents get complacent where they think they're handing their kids the tablet. They're buying their kids the phones. They're sure. giving yeah. 
And I used to work for a technology company to help prevent this. I was a lobbyist for a technology. We worked to prevent alcohol, tobacco, gambling, pornography, illegal drugs. You can sign up in Utah for it. It's yeah, uh-huh. do not contact utah.gov. But I'm passionate about that company and the work that they do. But I will say, I would tell people when I was out speaking to parent groups or teachers or whatever, when you put a phone in a child's hand, you give access to the world to your child. You're not giving your child access to the world. The world now right. has access Ooh, like to that. your child. Yeah. And I think it's an important thing to consider and remember. And I, you know, sometimes I tell people that and they would dismiss it. And, it, you know, you can't change a person's mind. But I think that these are conversations that we really need to be having because it's really damaging to our children, not only the pornography use, but the sexual trafficking going on on these yeah. phones, which also kind of feeds into the whole pornography thing, right? A lot of these people are adult people. They're getting children to take pictures of themselves, send them back to them. Right. They're using them to to market them and to sell these pictures. I mean, it's there's we could go on and on about the dangers yeah. of, of this kind of stuff. Yeah. So I appreciate that you're bringing this to your family. And I love that you have set boundaries with your own phone. So yeah. I would imagine right. that you're not parent- because your bishop said you have to. I mean, that's right. that fine line between is it shame? Is it some institution telling you or is it your choice recognizing what right. brings you peace? What brings you that sense of I'm in charge of my life and the addictions not ruling me? And yeah. I would imagine as a parent, you're setting those boundaries with other devices in your home for your family. Uh, of course. I mean, we're, we're big on screen time even. So like our, our kids don't watch TV until they're two. And even then it's like an hour a week max. And I, we'll talk about cell phones when it gets here. We haven't decided what to do yet, but whatever we do is very, very research based. And, you know, you know, we just want to make sure to set our kids up for success. We've That's talked awesome. about that a lot in our family. Oh, sorry. I just want to put yeah. my two cents in if that's okay. Oh, please do. Please do. I, so this is producer yeah. Kellyanne speaking. I'm so grateful that Hi. you're giving your kids the context for those feelings and for the human body and giving them a safe space. I personally had in elementary school, in first grade, in kindergarten even, girls come to me and tell me that they had been abused sexually or that these different things were going on. And since I didn't have the context for the situation, I wasn't able to you know, find a way to give these girls help. Because you didn't even know what to do with the information. And it was spoken like with such secrecy between us. I felt like I couldn't go to my parents. I remember being six years old and not knowing what sex was and writing the number six on a piece of paper because I was going to ask my mom. These girls were talking about this. It it rhymes. I can't remember what it was called. It rhymes with six. This is this is kind of the the, that was the word I was trying to associate it with. Um, And I chickened out. And I didn't realize till I was about 14 what these girls were coming to me and telling what had happened. Where if I had known more about sexuality, the human body, nakedness, boundaries, these different things, I could have gotten help for those kids. So that's one thing. It's yeah. not about talking and giving them context for pornography, for sexual situations, for those feelings that they're feeling. It's not just to help you, but it's to help others. So I just, yeah. I'm no, so I'm glad, glad you, gave, you said that. You're giving your kids these, this context. So when the situations come up, they know how to deal with it. That's a great yeah, I think insight. Another phrase that my wife even just reminded me of recently is don't say, I'll tell you when you're older. <laughs> yes. You know, if, if they have the curiosity and they've asked you the question, let's talk about it. It's, it's a thing they've already thought of. They brought it to your attention. You know, if it's awkward, say, you know, I, I know for us, it's like we got to go get the resources and make sure we get the talk track down. So it's like, let's talk about this later, but not let's talk. I'll, I'll tell you when you're older. Uh, that's, I, we don't like that. Right. That actually instills shame right away. Like this is something that right. I can't know that now. You shouldn't There's have something been asking. wrong. Yeah. I shouldn't have been asking yeah. it. Right. That creates yeah. shame immediately. So, yeah, I love that. When you have a child come to you with a question, I think sometimes, at least for me as a parent, where I had very little conversation as a child with these concepts, 
I tended to overshare, overcomplicate, <laughs> and overexplain. <laughs> and what I've learned in being a mom to four kids of various ages is sometimes you just need to answer the question that was asked, and it can be very simple. And it doesn't have to be the whole <laughs> yeah. story. It doesn't have to right. be the whole story. Yeah. You don't need to fill in all the context because they don't understand it anyway. And so the yeah. only context they're asking is the specific question that they're asking. And being comfortable asking the question. What I'm I'm looking at this thinking, we're talking a lot about shame. Mm-hmm. And shame coming in is almost like an outside emotion put upon you because somebody else's expectation of you has been not met. Versus there right. are feelings we all have. of, and, and guilt even almost feels like shame. But there are certain feelings we know we don't want to have because our behavior doesn't match our own desires or our own expectations. And being able yeah. to distinguish between, hey... I want to stay away from a pornography addiction, not only because I'm supposed to, but because my life is actually better when I do. And my kids and I, I hope they've, I hope they've heard this in several conversations just about addiction in general. And it might be to pornography and it might be to alcohol or drugs. Those are some of the top ones we think of, but it could be to screen time or video games. It could be to a a certain food or, you know, you know, people with other kinds of addictions and We've talked a lot in our family, our extended family, about the danger of addiction because the addiction then controls you. The addiction's making the choices. Mm -hmm. The addiction's leading not just to shame but to compulsion that you have to go. I love that you recognized it's a hit. You're looking for that dopamine hit. You're looking for that release. And it doesn't leave room for the good to replace it. You you can't fill it with good if... if it's not there. and you don't learn how to sit in the uncomfortable because sometimes life is uncomfortable yeah. you are angry you are yeah. sad you are bored yeah. and so often we want to fill that with something shopping spending pornography oh, yeah. drinking, we all do drugs, it to different all levels yeah. right some do it it's still not great but it may not be unhealthy right like and that's a different line for everybody for everyone i do want to clarify on the guilt and shame guilt and shame are both internal emotional feelings Guilt is something that will drive us to make a more moral choice exactly. in the future. Yep. Shame makes us feel bad about ourselves. And, then and that's the more difference. More likely to go deeper. That's actually yes. what I just written in my notes. Shame versus motivation. Like the, the guilt of, oh, I just lied to somebody. I probably should go tell them I'm sorry. Or I said something mean to someone. There is a sense of motivation behind the guilt to where I can change. And Braden, I appreciate that you said that I am not the addiction. Right. I am not the evil sex fiend because I had those feelings or what. Right. But also recognizing but I could do better. And not right. because sometimes I think the pendulum swings from where we don't want to feel shame and so we just pretend we feel nothing guilt or motivating and that we're just fine to be in that darkness. And I think most of us find that that darkness is not a beautiful place to be for ourselves. But the difference, I like how you've delineated that, Michelle, the difference with motivating to want to make a change, having hope that you can change and that you are not the mistake or the choice. And, you know, that's And you don't need to hide it. Brayden, you started with, you said, I am, what did you say? I am a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. And I heard the emotion in your voice. Or I am the plague. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I heard the emotion in your voice and I... It shatters my heart just to hear the pain that you obviously still connect with, that there was something inherently wrong with you, that something was broken, that you were damaged. And it's just not true. It's just not true. I think you're spot on. I think, you know, two big takeaways I hope anybody gets from listening to this. Is anybody struggling with this? You know, pornography, and it's maybe a somewhat controversial statement, but it, it, pornography doesn't destroy relationships. It's dishonesty and not connecting with your partner. It's hiding. It's not being trustworthy. Those destroy relationships. I love that. Than the anything. secrecy, the that's, hiding, the deception. Yeah, that's it. So when If somebody decides to disclose to you, hey, I'm struggling with this thing, First of all, they had to climb Mount Everest to tell you for the first time. Mm. And then second of all, the biggest thing they need from you is a hug, right? It's, so make sure they know that they are not a mistake. You know, the, the phrase I like is, I'm better than this. I'm better than this. If yeah. you relapse and you're, and you're getting down on yourself, guilt is, I'm better than this. Let's sit down, let's be proactive about figuring out what went wrong. 
Let's figure out what those feelings were that happened. Let's write it out. Let's do whatever it takes to get you because you're better. I love that. I, I love that. I, I want to say that you started out with Brene Brown and how you're a big fan. I am too. Yeah. And she says vulnerability is the birthplace of love, joy, courage, empathy, accountability, authenticity. Yep. What you're saying is, is that if somebody has the courage to be vulnerable with you, instead of seeing the mistake or having you go to a place of how that makes you feel about yourself, if you could just be present and recognize we all need love, we all need empathy. And if we can start when people are being vulnerable, having the courage to come tell us a truth, that we can set our own emotions aside and still say, I love you. Right. We're going to figure this out. It may not be okay. What you figure right. out may not be the solution to a happy life. It may be separation. It may be growth in a different way, right? Like there's no guarantee. Right. But it is the birthplace where those things can be born from. And you're never going to find love, joy, happiness, courage, empathy, accountability, or authenticity without being able to take that courageous step in vulnerability. And yeah. you'll never find and, intimacy and connection without it. Yeah, you have to. You know, I, I, I'm hearing in my head, I have, whenever I have this, sometimes I have it in larger groups, you know, intimate groups where I talk about my journey. And inevitably, there's always, not always, there's occasionally um, a woman will approach me and disclose to me, hey, my boyfriend, my husband has this issue. You know, what? What do I, and I, I'm not super good at talking about the betrayal trauma experience of this, right? So, that, you know, I ask, you know, if somebody discloses this to you, give them a hug. That's not always easy when it's your husband. You know? Right. In, in fact, quite, quite the opposite of easy to give your husband a hug when, he, when he's experiencing that. So that, that's a conversation I'm not super equipped to have. But I think what's important is, is that first aspect of it, right? That it's trust and honesty. The lack of that, that will destroy that relationship far, far faster than a pornography addiction, right? And so that's the part, you know, where I ask him, like, what is he doing to lean into this addiction? How much is he disclosing to you? I think those are the important things to, to do it. For me and my wife, we say all the time, the most important ingredient to our relationship is willingness. As long as we both stay willing to work through anything, we'll get through anything. Yeah. And she's been very willing. Uh, and I'm just, again, she's somebody I don't deserve. I don't feel like, you know, that, that woman I grew up dreaming about as a kid, you know, she's better than anyone I could think of. And her willingness to go through some really, you know, hard moment hiccups um, within our marriage, that willingness for both of us just to dive in and face our junk um, has been what makes a difference for us. That's really That's beautiful. beautiful. And I'm glad that you are able to have such an amazing woman that is standing by you. You know, the interesting thing is, is that you keep saying, I'm not deserving, I'm not worthy of her, but actually <laughs> you are. And yeah. your job, if you're not feeling deserving or worthy of her, is to become that person that you truly need to be to own being deserving and worthy of her. You actually already are, but there may be things in your life that you know that you can clean up even more. And you don't need to be self-effacing in that yeah. you are worthy of such a beautiful love. And it's I beautiful. I really appreciate you pointing that out. I, I, yeah, I need to be better at making sure that I, you know, I just don't want to take those, these moments for granted, I think, is the mindset that I try to stay in. But you're absolutely right. I love that you reminded me of that. Thank you. Yeah. Brayden, thank you for sharing this. We've got one question for you before we wrap yeah. things up. And usually we ask it at the beginning, but today we just drive, dove right into such important conversation can you, can you tell us what resilience means to you? All of this that we've shared today, all of that you've lived and learned, how would you put that into words? Resilience to me, you know, I think this is a different context, right, where setbacks happen, you know, in, in an addiction recovery life, like setbacks happen, right? And so I think resilience to me is remembering your own self-worth despite the setbacks that happen. So it's remembering, you know, whatever mistakes you make, whatever, resilience is, is Sitting back, remembering, I am a good person. I am a good person who makes mistakes. But I am a good person. And that resilience through it 
any mistakes that you make, I think, is, is, is what resilience means to me for this journey. That is so beautiful, profound. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to, to meet you. If it is only here, I think I might should join that speakers group. You Sounds should like, come be hey. with us. It's great. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I'm terrified of public speaking, but I, I need to get over that. But yeah. uh, you're a natural, Michelle. So interesting. Yeah, I agree. So interesting what you've shared with us. And I've wanted to have this conversation for a long time. I did mention that I had dated somebody who was a Mr. Nice Guy, had pornography issues. Yeah. It all went terribly awry. And, you know, so sorry. it's sad. It's okay because. Yeah, it, it worked out for the way that what you needed. It. You, yeah. Right. It was a gro- growing experience. I don't regret right. having it at all. In fact, you know, I have some great memories. But it also prepared me to have and accept a beautiful relationship that I now have. Um, I just want to thank you for coming on and being honest and vulnerable and sharing this with us and with our listeners. It's so often a private conversation and, and very few people want to step up and say, look, I struggle with this addiction. It's, it's just seen as probably one of the worst addictions worse than alcohol or like people can understand alcohol addiction they can understand smoking they can understand a lot of things but when it comes to sexual addictions and you know there's a wide berth of what that looks like right right it can be anything to pornography use occasionally to all the time to daily multiple times a day to you know stepping outside the marriage I, i mean it's a huge span of what yeah. that ends up looking like and how long it's gone on for. Right. So I, I really appreciate you coming on and having this conversation at all. It is a courageous thing that you've done. I appreciate it so much. And I'm really glad to hear that you're going out and speaking to others and that you're not going to allow this to dictate your worth or value. It's powerful. It means a lot. Um, it's been quite the journey to get here, but it's, let's talk about it. You know, when I was a counselor for the, the Adventure for Youth program, I'd spend Thursday night or Friday night somewhere in there, and I'd come in the boys' cabin, and I'd be like, hey, we're going to keep things light tonight. We're going to talk about porn. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> and, and But we would have this such a, a raw, awesome conversation because we talk about it. So let's talk about it. Yeah, because I you created that. a space for that. I love that. Well, thank you so much, Braden, for coming on today. If you've enjoyed what you've heard today on our show, remember to subscribe to our podcast so you'll be notified. We drop a new show every single Thursday. We would be grateful if you'd give us a rating and a review. It really helps us come up in the podcast lineup world so others can find us. If you or someone you know has a story about real life that they're willing to share or you are willing to share with us, you can find us on Facebook at Relentlessly Resilient, on Instagram, Relentlessly Resilient Podcast. Both platforms have a calendar link to set up a time to pitch your story for our show. Reach out. We'd love to have you on the show. Thanks to our amazing producer, Kellyanne Halverson, and our presenting sponsor, Minky Couture. And remember, whatever you do today, remember to be kind. You have no idea the challenges other people are dealing with in their lives. Have a great day, everybody.